being 9.50. Uh, I propose uh, this, the question the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, and it's a great honour to rise tonight on a day where, where some history has been made in this place, uh, uh, particularly with the historic signing of a trade agreement between uh, Australia and China. And tonight I too want to talk about history. I want to talk about uh, some of the history of the uh, National Party or Country Party as it was then called um, today, this year, sorry, not today, but this year. Uh, 2014 marks uh, 80 years since um, uh, Black Jack McEwen or John McEwen uh, was first elected to parliament. He was first elected as the member for Echuca on the 15th of September 1934, and it's been 80 years uh, since then. Um, and uh, I want to speak of him tonight, not just because of that uh, anniversary, uh, but also because uh, the uh, the Nationals Party, or specifically the Page Research Centre, uh, the Nationals Party think tank, uh, has republished um, John McEwen's autobiography uh, that was originally published in 1980. Uh, now, at the time, only around 200 uh, copies were printed, and uh, uh, I think that was quite a, a shame. Uh, I remember buying one of these books in a Lifeline book fair in Canberra for $2. Uh, and apparently I got it at a bargain price um, because of the limited uh, number of them around. And I thought that was a bit of a uh, disgrace to have that out of circulation, something as important as one of our former PM's uh, autobiographies. So uh, for a long time I felt that we needed to try and do something about it. I did nothing for a long time uh, until around Christmas last year and my wife and I actually retyped it up and put it into an e-book and finally was able to convince the Page Research Centre to, to help republish it. So it's a great thing it's out now. Uh, and uh, hopefully will remain uh, in our nation's record. Um, McEwen was an amazing person. Uh, he served in the other place here for uh, more than 36 years uh, as a member for three different federal seats. Uh, he was a minister for around a third of the first 70 years of this nation as, as, as a federation uh, and had a remarkable influence on the development of that nation. He was prime minister, of course, for a very short period after the death of Harold Holt for 22 days. Um, but he was actually acting Prime Minister for 550 days over his career, or almost a year and a half. Uh, and um, I think that record does mean that it's very important that we, we have a written record of what he did and achieved. And, and perhaps uh, because only 200 copies were originally printed, that has contributed something to, I think, the, a distortion of John McEwen's record and legacy. Uh, his name has been variously used uh, to promote or detract from certain policies, particularly protectionist policies, and he's no longer really a man or someone of uh, different hues and colours. Uh, he's become just a symbol for, for a set of ideas, uh, for protectionist ideas. But when you actually look at uh, McEwen's record and legacy and what he said, he is not just a two-dimensional figure of protectionism. Indeed, in John McEwen's first speech uh, to Parliament in 1934, uh, he did he said that our export industries, and I quote, have to regain the overseas markets which they have lost, lost largely as a result of the national policy of protection. I admit that the people of Australia have always supported a protective policy and that while we are entitled to disagree with that policy to a certain extent, we must submit to a decision reached by an overwhelming majority of, people, of the people. Uh, so very clearly from the start, McEwen only adopted protectionist policies because other parties in this parliament adopted them. There was no way of changing them. Indeed, the only party that still remains in this parliament, uh, one of the oldest parties, the second oldest party, the Nationals or Country Party, it is the only party that was formed for the ideas of freer trade. Uh, in 1920, the very first year of the Country Party, the Trade Minister, Walter Massey, Walter, the Trade Minister at the time, Walter Massey-Green, uh, proposed substantial increases in tariffs, and it was the Country Party who stood against those increases unsuccessfully. In 1934, the Country Party made it a condition of forming a coalition government with the United Australia Party that, for, that, that tariffs be removed on 465 items of machinery. That was, of course, to help farmers um, reduce their costs uh, and avoid uh, the increased costs of protection that often fall on our agricultural or mining sectors. But overall, the, the Country Party at the time had more losses on free trade than victories. Uh, so it adopted the maxim that if you can't beat them, join them. And thus, was uh, protection all round uh, given birth to. Now, um, it wasn't just the, uh, the, the Country Party or the uh, Liberal Party or the successors to the Liberal Party or the Labor Party that were supportive of protective policies at the time. People forget now uh, most Australian economists had that view too. 
indeed Australia's most famous, probably most famous ever economist, Colin Clark, bemoaned that fact in 1962 when he said that economists had taught the current of popular protection sentiment and have avoided the unpleasant task of having to educate public opinion out of its objectives. So in my view, we should be very careful not to condemn uh, John McEwen um, for the tactics he used on the battleground that he found himself on, uh, especially when he did not choose that battleground. He did not choose to be fighting um, specifically for protection. What he did do, though, is to choose uh, to support and protect uh, the wealth-producing industries of our nation, what he called the wealth-producing industries of our nation. And he spends quite a bit of time in his autobiography talking of that. In his view, the agriculture, mining and manufacturing industries which export goods or produce wealth in this nation to allow us to buy other things and, and also, of course, buy public services. Um, that was his ultimate goal. That was the end uh, for which he wanted to achieve things. And we should judge him on his ability or his uh, success uh, in achieving those objectives, not on the, the specific tactics he had to use to do so at the time. He was very much a product of his times, as we all are. Um, and he was quite successful in, in, uh, in, in trying to meet those goals and objectives. Uh, he, of course, on today, where we have signed a, a historic agreement with another nation to our north, uh, he showed uh, incredible courage and foresight. Um, to drive the, the push for an agreement with a trade agreement with Japan in, 19, in 1957. That, uh, that agreement was made or struck just 12 years after the end of World War II, just 12 years after Australia saw fully uh, the impact of the great abuse done to prisoners of war that were Australian during that war uh, by the Jap then Japanese imperial government. But just, t just a decade after that, McEwen was driving an agreement with that nation within cabinet, uh, often in a sole battle without the support, wider support of the RSL uh, and definitely without the support of the Labor Party. But that agreement has served this country well uh, in the 50 odd years since it was, it was signed, um, and we wouldn't be the same nation today if it wasn't for that. Now, some people say that um, McEwen, uh, because of his protectionist policies, he blackmailed the cabinet or he blackmailed. Uh, particularly the Liberal Party, uh, to support coalition policies. That's not true either. It's not true either. It was the policies of all parties, major parties, to support uh, protectionists. And indeed, um, uh, John McEwen was a coalition, coalitionist first and foremost. People forget in the 1930s he was kicked out of the Victorian Country Party for forming and joining a, a federal coalition government. Um, but he felt that a coalition government was the best way to achieve things. He once said. He once described the Liberal Party as the country party's political blood brothers. And he went on to say that there seems to be a view in some quarters that all we have to do is sit on the crossbenches and tell the government what to do. That is ludicrous. It doesn't work that way. That's advice that we could all still use today. It doesn't work that way because we've seen um, in the last few years how government to the highest bidder works and how disastrous it can be uh, for our nation. Um, we have always had the most successful governments in this country where there are people willing to work together towards common goals, uh, not trying to buy each other off um, based on who can offer the greatest price at the time. I said earlier that um, John McEwen was very much a product of his times. And, and the other thing that, as, as history recedes, that we forget is that the generation of leaders in the 1950s and 60s, of course, went through the crucible of the Second World War. Uh, and John McEwen uh, was right there at the forefront of that. He was a member of the War Cabinet uh, for part of the war and, and, uh, and, and also a member of the wider War Advisory Council uh, in the Curtin government. Uh, so he saw firsthand how Australia really only could put up a token defence of its nation, particularly early on in that war. Uh, and uh, People forget also that he played a crucial role in, uh, in capturing New Caledonia from the Vichy French government at the time, which was very important for the events of this nation. But because he'd seen that firsthand, uh, he, he wanted to make sure that we could defend ourselves uh, going forward. And that was another reason why he supported building up a strong manufacturing base in this country, uh, because, uh, of course, we wanted to avoid another ins existential threat um, because of that. All of this detail is often lost now. It's often lost 80-odd uh, years uh, since McEwen started his career. It's lost because the people who are writing about John McEwen now um, often didn't know him or certainly don't read first-hand accounts. So hopefully uh, this, this new edition of uh, John McEwen's autobiography can m play a small role in helping to correct that. Uh, it's uh, 80 years since his election, 
I think it's certainly time that his story is told in his own words. Thank you, Senator Canavan.